All right, folks, uh, now we are going to welcome to the show Keith Brower Brown. Keith is a correspondent for Labor Notes. You can read his writing in uh, Labor Notes as well as Jacobin and uh, in these times on this uh, UAW reform process. Keith, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Good to be here. Thanks for having me on, Dave. Yeah, happy to do it. Uh, we are excited to uh, touch on this. Um, you know, we talk a lot about uh, electoral politics and sort of the democratization and uh, and, and pressure there. Um, and this story, I think, is a bit of a breath of fresh air. Now, just to get everybody on the same page, what is the UAW and what is its place in American labor? All right. So UAW, colloquial in general stands for United Auto Workers, but also represents a ton of agricultural implement workers at John Deere, a ton of graduate student workers uh, like me at the University of California now make up almost a quarter of the 400,000 members of the UAW. And then uh, over half are in auto and other manufacturing still. And then there's a smattering of like uh, public workers, museum workers, logistic workers, also in the mix. And, uh, and so this uh, reform process, uh, we, we, you know, we talk about, you know, unions as just, you know, you achieve a union and it's, you've democratized the workplace, um, I think is maybe a, a naive way of looking <laughs> at this thing. Um, of course, if you, these unions have their own sort of uh, undemocratic structures. Talk about uh, the UAW, the conditions inside the UAW, and you can get as historical as you want um, with regards to what sort of, uh, how like responsive this organization is to its membership and uh, leading up to these reform efforts. Sure. So, Unions have this promise to be the most democratic institutions in society where we, the workers and members, figure out how we're going to take on the boss together. And yet a lot of times it's really hard to do that in practice. You know, there are real obstacles to bring people working 12 hour shifts, six days a week into setting the course of a huge 400,000 person organization. So in the UAW, there's probably no union that better epitomizes both the sort of rise and fall of American labor in most people's minds uh, than this union where you have this huge upsurge in the 1930s of militant sit down strikes and really creative worker leadership on the floor, uh, a ton of different left currents active in the union. Then in the late 40s, early 50s, you have this sort of lockdown of a ruling group which comes to be known as the Administration Caucus, which then for the last 70 years has been the one party state of the UAW mm. and has made the entire staff and leadership apparatus at the higher levels totally fused with this caucus where nobody on the board with one exception in all that time uh, on the top board of the UAW was not from this caucus. So it's pretty tight lockdown. Of course, that doesn't really matter to most members or come up except for the fact that the union is making huge concessions during this time in the 50s and 60s it becomes sort of the leader of uh setting the bar for the american labor movement winning cost of living adjustments or cola uh and thus sort of taking the rising cost of living out of the equation for workers which was at the time was sort of a compromise but now it looks like damn we want to get that back yeah uh so Winning stuff like that makes it this leader across the labor movement. It does pattern bargaining where you have one of Ford, Chrysler, GM bargain or go on strike first. And then that sets the pattern for others. And then other unions pattern their contract off the UAW auto contracts. So that was the leadership. But then without continuing to develop democracy and militancy at the roots of the union, you start to see some of that power fall apart. And the auto companies and their investors start to say we can break this union by uh, basically shifting a lot of production to anti-union states in the south, uh, mm -hmm. some of it overseas, but more than that, just like shifting around production into subsidiaries, into uh, lower tiers of work. So saying, oh, this is actually parts work now. This is something that you, you know, you union auto workers don't have to do or you're going to be paid half as much for doing. So especially in the recession, the union leadership starts to agree to these contracts where there's these really stark differences. If you're a new worker after 2008, 
you will never get a pension. You will never get health care after retirement. Your wage is going to be lower from day one. And a, most of that has not been made up since. Some of the wages, but the pension and health care is not. Mm -hmm. So that pissed off a lot of auto workers for understandable reasons and uh, started to foster a really apparently a pretty powerful movement to take back our union. There had been prior reform movements going back to the 50s, you know, when this one party state started, there's always been people fighting really important upsurges in the late 60s and 70s of black workers in Detroit, especially in uh, Kansas City, St. Louis, Texas area in the 80s. But it was really this this last upsurge that finally uh, you know, went over the crest. We won the right to democratic elections uh, about a year and a half ago, and then won those first elections. Could could you could you break down what that means for folks who aren't familiar with the, the democratic elections mean? Yeah. So, in a lot of unions, the top leadership is not directly elected by members. As you don't get a vote for the president of your own union mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. Uh, instead, your local, your union local elects delegates. So you get to vote for a delegate to a national convention, but these are often uncontested elections. And it's basically just local leaders who end up winning or basically appointing people uh, who are uncontested. So the those delegates then pick the president and pick the whole top leadership board. And it's sort of like a snake eating its own tail of people mm -hmm. patting each other on the back and saying like, okay, we, you know, we're going to keep running this thing together. Uh, and it's hard to challenge and break into that. So in 20, in the last sort of five to eight years, a huge corruption scandal broke in the UAW that key figures, including presidents in the administration caucus, um, were embezzling money, were making backroom deals with the auto corporations themselves to give them auto workers worse contracts, essentially. And we're getting golf bags and stupid stuff out of it, but we're selling out their duty in a lot of ways. And as a result of that, a federal monitor was appointed that came in. Similar process happened in the Teamsters and in the Laborers Union mm -hmm. uh, in the 80s and 90s, respectively. And in this case, the monitor said, we're going to require a referendum where every member gets to vote on whether they want the right to vote for the top officers. So we had a first vote just to say, do we want direct elections? We said yes by almost two thirds. Uh, big surprise. People voted that they wanted to vote. <laughs> and then uh, finally, we got our chance to actually campaign on a vision for what we wanted for the union. And we, we had been pushing, I think, all along this idea that we needed to end concessions in the tier system and in corruption. And that, that's that been the rallying cry of the UAWD caucus or Unite All Workers for Democracy going back to its inception about four or five years ago. Before we get into the UAD uh, caucus, were, were there rationalizations for the uh, continued lack of democracy or did it just kind of continue through inertia? Like, I guess early, like yeah. for, for a good portion, it was like, we're delivering goods. And then it was like, well, we delivered goods relatively recently. And is it now just a case where it's like, well, no one within living memory remembers when this was actually working for anybody. That's totally a problem. You know, shifting to a new system always brings some qualms. But I think there, there were some defenses of the old system. Uh, for the first time in history, the administration caucus actually came out as a public force. It had never like admitted its own mm. existence or its own name, even though everybody mm. knew it. And it created this website saying, that was called Protect the Wheel. And the wheel is the logo of the UAW, the sacred symbol of our solidarity. And uh, they said, we have to protect the wheel, protect our union uh, by allowing experienced people to, you know, our delegates to make this decision and hash it out together in a room rather than just the, the chaos of open-ended demagoguery and the membership. And there is this implication that like the members can't be trusted in the same way that these, you know, more experienced leaders can be. Um, Aside from that, I think there, yeah, there's also sort of a, 
some voices saying, well, there could be selfishness instead of looking out for retirees or instead of looking out for uh, the new organizing needs, because obviously we're at 10 percent union membership in this country. We need to be mm-hmm. organizing a lot more workers. What if we're just looking out for like our own you know, current wages or something like that? Mm. Uh, but again, I think that you know, assumes a lot too little of most union members that being a part of a union shows you the power of solidarity when we're at our best and shows you why we need to fight on behalf of a broader multiracial mm-hmm. working class in a way that, uh, you know, being a union leader, making a, a really solid salary might not be a better guide to that than just being a, a rank and file worker. So uh, not to preempt too much what we're going to talk about specifically with UAW, but Keith, I'm curious if like, so like we, we, you were just mentioning like how low union density is in this country. Um, you know, you were mentioning the corruption scandals. Um, and I think that like there is like a real need. And I think it's we're seeing in the UAW, we're seeing it in the Teamsters, we're seeing it a lot of like union movements in this country to really democratize these these structures and, and these systems. I see sometimes because... Um, you know, the union movement is, has been on the back foot for my life, right? And probably the generation before me, too, that sometimes amongst people, there's like a hesitancy to sort of be able to play ball on like two different fronts, right? Like recognizing that, like, we need to be expanding union membership in this country. And also within the union movement itself, like we definitely need a lot more democratization. I'm just curious for you as somebody who writes about this, as somebody who has a union member, like, how do you sort of, you know, walk that line where it's like, you know, we're not playing playing into, for example, like the union busters who are going to come in there and say, oh, you know, these are all corrupt, blah, blah, blah. They're not democratic. They don't want to support you. Right. Like making these 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 criticisms and trying to build and make the union move more more democratic without sort of falling into like anti-union talking points is what I'm asking. That's a really important goal. I mean, we're in a very uh, despite the 70 percent of Americans who say they like the idea of unions, it's a very hostile world Mm -hmm. to try and organize labor. And I think for UAWD, the key has been to focus on positive reforms that will strengthen the power of the rank and file in fighting the boss. Just keep Mm -hmm. bringing back to fighting the boss. We do, you know, one of the three top slogans, no tears, no concessions, no corruption. Corruption is there. A lot of people are pissed about that for understandable reasons, but that has not been a major, major focus of what we've put to put forward at a, UAW conventions like the one last summer, the one last week, we've uh, really focused on getting bigger and earlier strike pay to strengthen the ability of more workers to go out and strike. And we won major reforms on that last summer. Uh, At this last convention last week, uh, we were pushing for stronger strike preparation and a real uh, contract campaign that would get members putting pressure on the boss and organizing each other creatively, not just waiting around for September for the bargaining team to figure stuff out and then maybe call a strike. So focusing on those sort of like concrete ways that Mm -hmm. we're going to beat the boss is the key. Union democracy on its own matters to some people, but if you really want to get a lot of busy, tired, stressed out people to uh, realize that we can be stronger by fighting this out together, we got to bring it back to fighting the boss. And what are some of those? Like, how do you make that pitch? Well, it's not hard when the boss has been as brutal as they have been in auto. Uh, and I mean, across the UAW and higher ed too, mm-hmm. uh, there's been a lot of really brutish low wages and discriminatory and harassing bosses, you know, across the board. So uh, having a, Stronger approach to striking, both in terms of advanced preparation, building up more member-led kind of contract campaigns has been an idea. We've been trying to build up also a very labor notes kind of approach, but (laughs) across many unions, it's there. There's uh, a real, you know, focus on tiers as this essential divide and conquer strategy from the boss that we need to get beyond. Uh, And there's a version of that in auto, in other parts of manufacturing, uh, certainly in higher ed with adjuncts and many different Mm -hmm. tiers of workers doing similar work for uh, very unequal pay and security. So those issues have helped us talk to each other across sectors. And yeah, I think that 
trying to keep focused on, you know, we're going to do these reforms internally in our union so that we can get back to fighting the boss uh, and have a lot more strength to do it has been the key. Uh, you know, we haven't always made that clear enough or, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to convey, but apparently it was clear enough in the end that we were able to win a majority of the top board of the top officers of the union in this election, including the presidency. Uh, and now the ball is in the court of reformers to essentially deliver on the, these strategies. And it's going to be a, a tall order. You know, this is the harder, better work to have cut out for us. Uh, but I, I feel pretty hopeful. I mean, let's let's talk about the, the this reform movement. I mean, could you talk about Sean Fain and the, this uh, UAW presidential campaign? Sure. So Sean Fain was the uh, candidate of the Reform Caucus and sort of broader coalition of reformers across the UAW uh, under the Members United slate. He is a proud UAWD member and came to UAWD events to really say how proud he was to be a member and uh, participate in the last week convention and prior. So that's pretty special to have a union president now who is you know, an active participant in rank and file caucus that, uh, you know, goes beyond the situation, the team series where you have allies of the rank and file caucus who have made its presidency. So very excited about that. Sean comes out of uh, being an electrician uh, in the UAW in Indiana, and then becoming a local president, uh, a leader among uh, skilled trades workers, joining international staff as a rep and, being a, a very rare kind of dissident voice within the mm -hmm. UAW International Union, speaking out against concessions. Uh, and then there were, were uh, a bunch of other auto worker local leaders elected to the top officer board, like Margaret Mock, who uh, comes out of a Chrysler Stellantis local and becomes now secretary treasurer. Uh, and then there was one uh, higher ed worker, former president of the Harvard Grad Students Union, who gets elected the president or the regional director of the Northeast region that includes a lot of higher ed units. So nice mix or very closely tracks the actual membership of the union. And uh, yeah, just one last person I'll mention I'm very excited for is uh, Dan Vicente, who uh, just a couple of weeks ago was working on the shop floor in Pennsylvania in a mm. ship building or manufacturing uh, facility and ran, you know, just with great principles and a strong movement behind him and ended up being a very entrenched regional director. I mean, I, I can't tell you just like from what I've been seeing in the UAW to what I've been seeing in the teams, there's like feeling very excited to see what's going to happen over the next couple of years. I'm curious. Um, if you could give folks a, a sense, I know it's not always as easy um, as, as people would like, but y'all labor notes do a good job at this. Like, you know, what's the makeup of, of, of these voters? I mean, like who is showing up and supporting this, this campaign, um, you know, in, in, in general. Well, I'm not going to go all Nate Silver on you with like a detailed breakdown. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, top line, what's exciting? Like yeah, anything yeah. you saw when you when you got into it that was like, oh, that's interesting. Or Yeah. So there are about 400,000 active members of the UAW today and about 600,000 retirees. And retirees had the right to vote in this election. And that's something that reformers campaigned for to ensure they would. Uh, their pensions are run uh, in significant part by the union. So really important that they should have a say. We actually campaigned for them to have the right to run as candidates too, but the incumbents admin caucus shot that down. Uh, so in any case, it was, it was sort of this big question mark how they would come, but it turned out that retirees uh, in general were quite supportive of a reform, which was not something you yeah. could necessarily guess in advance. Then among, uh, the big three auto companies, there is this clear sort of trend where Chrysler Stellantis, as it's now called, uh, which has been the most sort of brutally treated by the boss in a lot of ways, had, has had the worst shake on the shop floor. Uh, they pushed really hard for reform. Uh, they voted really strongly for the Members United reformer slate. Then Ford, which has sort of gotten the best shake and has had in some ways, the most 
like profitable corporation and gotten a slightly better deal along the way and has been sort of the apple of the eye of UAW leadership for years, they ended up pretty heavily backing the incumbents um, with mm. a few exceptions. And then uh, GM sort of fell in the middle and other sectors were a mix, but higher ed um, only made up about 2.5% of voters overall, okay. uh, even though it's closer to 20, 25% of membership. Uh, was this, so that was like a low voter turnout or low voter turnout. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reflecting a lot of factors, uh, you know, high turnover of members in those mm -hmm. locals because people leave within five to seven years. And also for auto workers, the international union negotiates your contract mm -hmm. is directly the bargaining team is the top leadership of the union. In a higher ed local like mine and at the University of California, you elect your own local bargaining team who handles stuff. So the international is kind of just this far away thing where, mm -hmm. you know, we did get uh, 83, 84% support for reformers out here, but turnout was low no matter our efforts, uh, just because it's like so far from the mind of your everyday concerns. Do do uh, members from uh, closed, shop have, closed shops have the right to vote? in these yeah good question if they're retirees they do okay um can you guys explain yeah. the uh, the terminology close shop so with all those plant closures that i was mentioning earlier that were by design of the corporations to uh, help bust the union as much as they could you have huge numbers of locals that basically their plant no longer exists. And so there's still a local number. There, in some cases, might still be like a local organization of retirees or members who used to work there who stay in touch. Um, I'd have to get back to you on, on where the line is drawn for those, but there are definitely closed locals that turn in numbers. And my assumption is that most of them were. This, you know, people might have to check me on this later. I think I was reading Jonah Furman sort of uh recap of this and 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 he was saying that like some early there were some early signalings that like a lot of people who were in places you know where their shop closed were voting more heavily for um um for the reformers but again i don't know if they were retirees or whatnot um but again like you know makes sense in a sense that like if your shop closes that you might want to change in leadership okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I, I know we got a lot more to get to. So just since we have you here, though, I think it is helpful. And I know you probably get this a lot from folks because a lot of people are a little confused as to the graduate um, student side of the union and the auto work union. I mean, could you just give people a general sense about how that came to be? Because I think it is a question we get every single time we bring up the UAW. Sure. Yeah, I, I've been asked by plenty of auto workers too at these <laughs> conventions. Like, how did, how did this end up happening? Uh, in the 80s and 90s, as graduate students, A, started to take on more of the labor on campuses and be more exploited as a result, uh, mm. there started to be this growth in interest in unionizing. Uh, in the 90s, uh, there was a huge success at the University of California unionizing across all 10 campuses at once, essentially. And that became what is now the second largest local in the whole UAW. Uh, hmm. And then postdoctoral researchers and some other kinds of research staff unionized with UAW soon after there. A lot of other universities have followed into the UAW and it's now the largest union of grad student workers. Um, why did the UAW take a chance and you know support and bring in these workers is a little hard to read because it wasn't a super open, open democratic decision-making process at the time at the top level. Um, there are theories ranging from uh, just a good faith belief that this is a way to expand the labor movement um, mm -hmm. to a more kind of suspicious read that uh, the administration caucus at the time thought this would be a way to get in a lot of new members uh, who will pay a lot of dues and will not be as pissed off or have their jobs as threatened as auto workers. So it'll be kind of like a stable dues base when a lot of the rest are leaving. And I don't go in too far for, you know, trying to figure out exactly how it all played out, but 
at this point, I, I think it has been a, a really fruitful um, collaboration in the reform movement between the different, you know, sides of the union and, uh, you know, certainly not grad students running the show. Uh, you know, no, actually, like, no, just like to be really clear about that, because like, you know, yeah. there's all these this discourse about like the PMC or whatever. You, you, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Like, mm. this is not like just like just so we're very clear here for anybody who's listening and thinks that like what happened is the UAW expanded and they got a bunch of fancy folks from Columbia or, you know, NYU or no fancy University of California system. And they like overthrew the old guard at like the, you know, the opposition of, of the membership. No, as you were just saying. The votes in, in this most recent election was like, what, 2% of 2.5% yeah. were grasses. I think it would be even better if it was 20%, right, fully. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing in and of itself, but also just so we're operating from the sense of, of reality and not creating these these weird tensions that I think a lot of online left media is starting to get really good at doing is trying to find ways to divide the labor movement um, between itself. Um, so anyway, sorry not to cut you off, but I just want to be very explicit about that for anyone listening. Um, back to the uh, the auto workers. Can we move to why this is actually an important point in auto making history that uh, we start to democratize this workplace? You know, David's uh, been talking about this electric vehicles as uh, something we need to make sure uh, is not an end around union shop. So can you just touch a little bit on uh, electric vehicles then we can maybe broaden out to the uh, green economy uh, uh, larger. Definitely. So right now, basically the entire U.S. auto industry is shifting hard towards electric vehicles. And, uh, you know, GM has said majority by 2030, we're talking like the end of this decade, majority of their vehicles they're selling, going to be electric vehicles, uh, may end up being faster because uh, CEOs, turns out, love electric vehicles a lot of the time because it saves on labor costs and it uh, is a union busting strategy as it's been mm -hmm. conceived a lot of the time from uh, investors and executives at these companies where they're going to move a large amount of production out of these top tier union factories into uh, non-union joint ventures or subsidiaries that uh, are paid at parts wages or even worse, where you have temporary workforces where you're trying to like simplify the production process uh, and cut out the union as much as possible. And so far, unfortunately, they've succeeded at that more than you would like. Uh, this kind of began in a spicy side story under the recession again. Uh, Obama, as part of the bailout of the automakers said, well, it wasn't Obama's help, but part of this deal that he supported and pushed through was that the factory where the Chevy Volt was being made at the time, mm -hmm. the sort of pilot of this whole EV model was going to be at a lower tier to try and save money for the company. And that ended up in some significant ways setting a template for the whole auto industry that this is going to be lower tier work. We're going to get away with making uh, you know, the drivetrain of the car at what we mm -hmm. used to pay someone who makes, uh, you know, just the siding on a door or something like that and turns out some plastic piece. But this is, you know, extremely technical work. A lot of the time doing chemical engineering adjacent kinds of work uh, beyond my chemistry abilities for sure. <laughs> so a big, almost existential question for the UAW in this moment is how do you make sure this work is not just unionized, but at top tiers. And uh, to that challenge, a uh, major theme of Sean Fain's campaign and of the convention last week was we're going to unionize this transition. Uh, we're not going to allow these companies to say just because they're shuffling the work into some shady joint venture that it doesn't fall under a UAW contract. We're going to demand this year in the contract negotiations uh, that the EV work all falls under our contracts already new plants are going to be automatically unionized would be the takeaway from that but then actually boosting up that work to a higher tier might be a longer battle we'll see uh if we get rid of significant parts of tiers in the contract as well that would be two birds with one stone uh you would bring up the eb work too 
-hmm. And then there's a whole question of how you help those workers in these emerging plants, especially if they're, you know, in Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, are getting a lot of this EV work. Uh, how do you help those workers themselves build up strong mm -hmm. fighting democratic unions, not just show up, oh, you have a union, great, but actually really help them lead what this union will become in EV workplaces, that's going to be a key question for us to figure out. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, 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 it's critical in a lot of ways, not just in the UAW, but like <clears throat> you see here in Texas and I'm assuming in the rest of the country, like, you know, solar panel installation is like oftentimes sort of put up against organized labor here. Um, you know, and there's this kind of mentality, it's like, oh, it's green, it's good. And it's like, totally, you know, let's build more green stuff. Let's save the environment. But like, you know, capitalists and bosses want to do the same shit that they have always done, whether or not it's a combustion engine or an EV vehicle. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, as a, so this is like a, a fairly, um, I mean, this is like recent, the, the change in like the, the more direct democracy. Um, are there any things else that are sort of happening within the union in addition to like being able to vote for leadership that you might want to highlight as things that are making it feel more democratic or is it really like this ability for union members to have influence over leadership that is like the, the crux of this reform? The emergence of a strong rank and file caucus is itself kind of a mm -hmm. step forward to have a, a space for workers, no matter if they're on their first day, rank and file newbie to uh, you know local president can all hash out ideas together. Uh, that's pretty new for at least decades, and it's a really good step. Uh, mm -hmm. And UAWD has been really committed to serious internal democracy and you know welcoming people from different sectors. So that's a good step. Um, sells lots of room to grow, but uh, this moment is one where you know, that, can, that could happen fast. Beyond that, uh, there's been a, a turn towards more striking recently across mm -hmm. a bunch of different workplaces. And I have witnessed with my own eyes how the immediate kind of stakes of a strike, bring out a creativity from rank and file workers in a way that a lot of other kinds of union activity, it's harder to get there. But when suddenly it's like, wait, we could, we're risking losing our jobs or we're, you know, our contract is on the line and uh, there's a picket line and you're either on one side or the other, that can mm -hmm. really bring out uh, a kind of solidarity of communal creativity of risk taking that helps the union uh, be this living fighting animal going forward. So the fact that we had a major strike at John Deere a few years ago yeah. that inspired people across uh, our union, across many different sectors. Uh, GM went on strike in 2019, not the, not a super successful strike, disappointing in key ways, but also showed that there's this continued willingness to strike. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an amazing thing about the UAW that you might expect with that sort of anti-democratic leadership for a long time that striking wouldn't really be a, a muscle anymore. Well, actually when strike votes happen in auto and other parts of the UAW, they usually pass by you know, 95, 98%. And then participation is super high in auto strikes in the mm. UAW where everybody knows like you turn out, you, you do not cross the line. Uh, so how that has been maintained is its own whole own deep history to figure out, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's exciting and makes it feel like uh, a September auto strike. And one of the big three automakers this fall with a combination of this uh, more militant leadership, that's going to draw a hard line and build a stronger contract campaign, a caucus helping build that from below a rank and file. That's clearly pissed off enough to boot the old leaders uh, and this, you know, enduring muscle of striking together that could start to win back a huge amount of what's been lost. That'd be huge. Um, unless you have anything else, Matt, do we want to talk about DSA? Yeah, I'm just curious, Keith. I watched your talk uh, with DSA uh, on the uh, Revolutionary Green New Deal. I'm just curious, you know, we talk a lot about uh, DSA attempting to impact things on an electoral front. How do you conceive of DSA's role on the labor front? Sure. So I've been a member of East Bay DSA since late 2016 and uh, 
have helped out with a lot of strike support campaigns. And I think that's sort of the, the no brainer, really useful way that DSA can uh, mm -hmm. help back strikes by turning out members to picket lines. It can, I've seen DSA in Oakland be the key sort of community support organization for the Oakland teacher strike and then a public health care worker strike here a couple of years later. Uh, not just turning out picket lines, but also organizing uh, food for picket lines and for kids missing school, helping organize child care, all that, all that sort of creative. Mm -hmm. you know, this is like mutual aid in the moment where it's like really mutual, where it's like, this is going to help the class have a breakthrough. And it, you know, brought everybody together. Even people have been fighting about mutual aid like three months before. We're like, okay, this is a moment where like, yeah, it's totally worth doing. Um, so beyond picket support and strike solidarity, uh, there's spreading the word about labor, uh, a handful of different chapters to like local newsletters or like reporting interviews with workers, um, sort of like a mini labor notes approach. I think that's a great thing to do, even just as a way mm -hmm. for members to learn about what's going on and build some connections. Um, political education, I think might be the most sort of like enduring but sort of behind the scenes role of DSA, I've seen, mm -hmm. you know, for myself and for tons of other people active in this UAW reform movement, um, that DSA was a place where they learned a lot about politics and how to organize, uh, sometimes organizing an electoral campaigns, sometimes strike solidarity, sometimes in you know, socialist night schools. And that's, uh, I think, a really important role for it to play going forward is just being this landing pad for new leftists to figure out where to plug in, maybe take a union job down the line. Maybe. I mean, I love the rank yeah. and file strategy a lot nice. personally. Me too. Big <laughs> fan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's beautiful to see, uh, you know, hundreds of DSAers at least. And I'm sure there are plenty that I, beyond my view who have taken jobs, uh, in nursing as electricians as teachers um mm -hmm. with a vision of helping build fighting unions and there's just a power you can have from being a union member working with people every day together uh that you're not going to have as just like an outside activist and we need a lot more of that um there's an organization starting up soon called the rank and file project having a national launch in the next month or so, if I remember right, that's sort of aimed at helping more people do that. Um, whether they're fully socialist or just sort of young radicals looking to help change the world in some way and want some mentorship. So I'm excited to see more of that happen. Do we want to get to our boy, Maddie, Maddie for a second? Well, I feel like we kind of already addressed the Matty Glacius. Yeah. Uh, I just, I just, you know, if we're not going to get to him, I just have to say, <laughs> when I was in college in D.C., Matty Iglesias would come to my bar that I worked at all the time in a box t-shirt. <laughs> Awful tipper. And like, look, I'm, I'm nobody, like, if you don't drink, that's, that's fine. But he would sit there for fucking like four hours with people and would just drink Coke, which I never charged anybody for Coke because it felt wrong would leave nothing and would always wear Vox branded shit with the fucking mustard stain on it. And I don't know. Um, funny, funny guy. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, really, really appreciate you coming on and chatting with us, Keith. I mean, this is, uh, is, I think what's happening again in the UAW, I think across the labor movement in general it should like, you know, like the excitement for unions in this country is great. Seeing more militancy from unions themselves, I think should get you even more excited. Um, because that's how they build when people say, oh, that's the thing that's going to improve my life, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which I think should be the focus of a lot of our politics. Absolutely. Yeah. This year uh, with UPS, hopefully going on a incredible strike and uh, uh, one of the UAW big three going on a strike could be a real turnaround for private sector union militancy. So uh, excited to be a part of it with yeah. you and a lot of the folks hopefully listening. Well, thank you well, so much, Keith. We're going to have... Yeah, oh, sorry, Matt. I was just going to say, Keith, where should people follow uh, your you so they can uh, keep abreast of this? Sure. So I'll uh, be writing for Labor Notes about the UAW and electric vehicles throughout this oh, yeah. year. Uh, labornotes.org. Tons of resources for how to build your union and current coverage there. And then uh, 
I have a Twitter at Trails and Ways. Uh, you can follow me there, although I'm a pretty minimal poster, but uh, <laughs> good when I do. <laughs> it seems like you're do- using your uh, time a little bit more wisely. Than, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think so, friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but thank you so much, Keith. We'd love to do it again sometime in the future. And uh, yeah, folks, definitely keep uh, abreast on, on Keith's work at LaborNets. Nets.